diagram, if it's a dot, that means the cell is unoccupied. If it's a number, then the number will indicate the speed of the vehicle that is occupying the cell. For example, here, a vehicle occupying is occupying this cell. And the speed is 4. So in the next step, you will move forward 4 cells. This is time, this is the space. And let's take a look at this. This time, the vehicle's speed is 5. And it's 4. Uh, the speed uh, the vehicle ahead of it has speed of 4. So the vehicle ahead of it will move forward for 4 cells. And this one can also move forward for 5 cells. But after that, it has to discrete. According to the car falling model, it may discrete, it, uh, it decrease its speed according to the rules. And these can be seen as a trace of the vehicle. So this is a trace. Uh, it's a trace of one vehicle. This is a trace of another vehicle. And these lines, if we combine them together, plot them, we can see the time-space uh, curves. Any question about this? So remember, each cell in cell automata, let me emphasize this. In cell automata, the cells are having some states. And each cell can be occupied by only, by at most, one vehicle. And the speed of the vehicles are changing according to simple rules. That's one dimensional thing. One dimensional uh, cell automata. Now let's take a look at transients, cellular automata transients. In transients, according to the latest, uh, to a training, training uh, session, they implemented the cellular automata both at the both for the rows and the intersection. But I couldn't find it. I checked the movement by using the arc, uh, arc map. So let me show you what it is. This purple line means a link. So it has two directions and has two lengths. So we have an intersection, we have this link, this link, that link, and that link, four links. This green, green uh, circle is a uh, node. So we are taking a look at the intersection. And here are two snapshots. The first snapshot is the yellow one. And within the polygon is the vehicle ID. Probably you won't clearly read it. But let me show you this a vehicle ID, and this is a vehicle at this time step. It's A3001. After one second, I use this blue polygon to indicate uh, the vehicles. So you will see, in the first second, this vehicle is here. After a second, it's here. For this vehicle, in the first, time, in the first second, it's here. In the second second, it's there. Oh, it's here. It's here. So these two uh, times uh, two snapshots can well represent the movement of vehicles at each time step, and you will see that in the last time step the vehicle is at the end of this link, but in the begin in the next time step is already in another link on another link. So there is no movement within this intersection. At least for the users, we won't be able to see it. All right. Then probably we can we can see transients implementation on the involving. Uh, we can we can think in that way that it only involves these link links, but not intersections. Only the links are divided into cells. At least at least to our end users. And if we check the transient snapshot file, we will see that for each record, it has you will always have a link ID, link ID and offset and speed, and the speed here is discrete. Twenty-two point five is equal to three multiplied by seven point five. Seven point five is the length of the cell, and this speed is three is equal to three cells per hour, and the acceleration will be one cell per hour. It is. So the speed in transients are always by number of cells. So it's not very smooth. And the position of the vehicle in a snapshot file will always on a link. 
Now, let's formally talk about transient car falling model using cellular automata. This is also very simple. It's, I think the, these are the criteria that appear simpler than the previous one. So let's review it. You will, the vehicles will accelerate whenever possible. And they will decelerate if necessary, if they are constrained. And sometimes for no reason, which means for uh, the random, uh, randomly. In transients, we have some constraints of speed. The first one is the speed limit of the link. The second one is the maximum speed that the vehicle can attain, which is the maximum speed of the vehicle. The third one is important. I want you to know is the maximum global velocity. This one is the characteristic of transients. The maximum global velocity is a configuration key. I don't see it in micro simulator. Maybe it's already hard coded. It's equal to five cells per second. And if the cell length is 7.5 meters, then the maximum global velocity will be around 80 miles per hour. Remember this, global, maximum global velocity is 5 cells per second. And the frontal gap, this is constraint. Now let's review the lane changing pro concepts before we talk about lane changes, lane changes in transients. This is subject vehicle, this is a lead vehicle, this is a lag vehicle, and this is the lead gap, this is a lag gap, and this is adjacent gap. Three gaps. And here are three several things I want to talk uh, talk about before I introduce the transient lane change model. The first thing is the lane change takes place before the inlay movement, before the car falling. I already introduced that. The second thing is, the left lane changes are made on even time steps. Even time steps, like two, four, five, uh, two, four, six. Only on even time steps, the vehicles will change left. On other time steps, vehicles will change right. So change left, change right, change left, change right for different time steps. This is also simplified. Another, simplific another thing is, if we model the left lane changing, then the lanes are processed from left to right. So we first take a look at the leftmost lane, then the second leftmost lane, then the third leftmost lane, one by one. So if we have three, three lanes, then we, at this time step, we are considering the vehicles changing to left. Then we first change this left, uh, change the vehicles on this, this lane. They don't have the ability to change left. Then we take a look at this lane. So we move vehicles on this lane first. Then we move vehicles on this lane for the later. In this way, the vehicles can be moved efficiently. All right. So that's one tip, I think. The next thing is the lane changes will happen only if the cell on the adjacent lane is vacant. If you want to change left, then the cell of uh, on the left lane should be vacant. That's obvious according to the logic. In transients, if there is a pocket lane, this is a special case, if there is a pocket lane, and this vehicle has to change left, and this pocket lane is full, then this vehicle will firstly decelerate to reach this point, and then it will wait at that point until it can find a gap. This is only for pocket lane, uh, turning pocket lanes. Remember this. This is special case. It has nothing to do with uh, to our uh, to the logic I'm going to introduce next. Now, uh, do you still remember what discretional lane change is and mandatory lane change is? Discretional lane change, lane changes are the lane changes that only for improve the traffic condition. 
only for getting a better traffic condition. The mandatory lane changes are for turning, for turnings, for uh, uh, following the path. Transient discretion or lane change, a lane change has three parameters. The first parameter is called weight one, and weight one represents the importance, the motivation of this lane change. For discretion or lane change, weight one will be equal to one if these two conditions are satisfied. If v plus one, v plus one is bigger than GC. GC is a frontal gap. So if the current speed is larger than the gap minus one, and this gap is larger than this gap, if these two things, two uh, conditions are satisfied, then we have a motivation to change left. So, do you so if GF, the uh, leading gap is larger than the frontal gap, that's a good reason to change leg. And if the current gap is not big enough to hold the to hold the v plus one, v plus one is the it means the acceleration, the accelerated speed. The current speed is v v plus one will be an acceleration. If the current gap cannot hold an acceleration, and if the front the lead gap is larger than the current frontal gap, then it has a motivation. Then width one is assigned one. So this is a good reason to change length, it's motivation. But when you change length, you have two obstacles. They are represented respectively by weight two and weight three. Weight two is equal to V minus V minus GF. Now let me take a look at our velocity and uh, lead gap. For this GF, is the big, the better. GF, the lead gap is the, the big, the, the better. And for the velocity, if the velocity is too big, if the velocity is too big, then the vehicle, then this lead gap will not be good enough. But when the velocity is small, then this lead gap will be good. And that's why they compare this current velocity and the lead gap. Typically, in this case, in this case, the v is v is two, and lead gap is four. So weight two will be calculated as minus two. <coughs> minus two. What is weight one? Could you calculate weight one here? If v minus one is bigger than current gap, if two plus one is larger than this, correct? And G 